you are never quite sure how the sequel to something is going to go. January, 12 weeks ago, I did my first ever high rocks, possibly the best test for fitness for anybody at any level that there is, and I loved it, despite not really preparing for it in any way. Just yesterday, I'm still exhausted, I did my second, and this time I prepared a lot. Time, money and effort went into this sequel in an attempt to make it better than what was already a pretty good showing. So, did I go from Terminator Arnold to Terminator 2 Arnold, or Predator Arnold to Danny Glover? Let's find out. If you have no idea what High Rocks is, don't worry, I'm going to cover it all in a minute and also going to talk briefly about my own fitness background. But then the bulk of this video is going to be a sort of comparison looking at how yesterday's event in London went versus my High Rocks in Manchester three months ago. What was better, what was worse, how did I do? Hopefully this will be beneficial if you've not yet done a High Rocks and are thinking of trying one or have already done one, maybe yesterday's, and are wondering how to improve for your next. If you've done lots, if you're an elite, experienced athlete, it'll probably be of no value to you at all, but you do get to hear my wife screaming, no pain, at me from the sidelines. No pain! No pain! No pain! No pain! So stick around for that. Right, if you know what High Rocks is, and have already heard me rambling on about eating too many donuts and seeing the photographs of me when I used to be a fat lump, feel free to jump straight to this point here, where the actual coverage of yesterday's race will start. Right, if you're still here, I guess that means you are new to High Rocks or new to the channel or just can't get enough of those fat lump photos. There you go, happy now? Right, gonna keep this short and sweet because I cover it in my Manchester video, which I'll link up the top to, and that's probably the one to watch before this one. But in summary, High Rocks is a multi-discipline indoor fitness competition. They take place in a bunch of different locations in a bunch of different countries, but the event itself is always identical. So you can compare your performance to every other athlete in every other place. And of course, as I'll be doing in this video, compare yourself to previous attempts. The competition is open to anybody of any standard. There are some elite athletes taking part, but there are plenty of regular Joes. In fact, there is no competition I've ever done where people of all differing abilities are just so well thrown together in a blur of sweaty bodies, which if you're a bit slower or new to the competition or perhaps new to fitness is brilliant. It's not like a marathon where you know you're towards the back. Here, there are constant waves of new runners starting their race while others are already doing theirs. You're running laps, you're going past slower people, faster people are coming past you. Nobody watching can really tell where anybody is relative to anybody else. As I'll come on to, if you're competitive, that presents some challenges, but if you just want to focus on having a good time and not feel that you look like you're a back of the pack type runner, it's marvellous because you are in the thick of it no matter what your ability. The event itself is very straightforward. You run a kilometre, which is two laps around the arena. You then come into the arena and you get yourself to your exercise zone. You do your exercise and you then get back out onto the track and you run another kilometre. You then get back into the arena, you do your second exercise and you keep going till you've done all eight laps, all eight exercises. Every exercise is a tough challenge, but all doable by everybody. This is not an obstacle course race where you might just flat out fail to do the monkey bars or CrossFit where you might just, I don't know, it's CrossFit. <laughs> My apologies to CrossFit, I just love that clip. There is nothing in High Rocks that you can't do. You might just do it slower, until you can do it faster. If any of that is still complicated, don't worry, it will all become very self-evident as we go through my race. And as for me, if you're new to the channel, welcome. I am somebody who in their mid-30s decided to no longer be grossly overweight and out of shape. I started jogging and eating less. After 10 boring years of doing that, I realized that in my mid-40s, I felt better than ever and wondered what I could do with that new lease of life I had. And so I began trying all sorts of sports I'd never done before. Some trail running, some Spartan races, started going to the gym, a bit of cycling during lockdown. Ah. With no real aim other than to put a modest amount of effort into those things in order to find myself hopefully a bit above average at all of them. Christmas last year, I heard of High Rocks for the first time. It sounded like fun. So I signed up for January's event in Manchester just four weeks later and completed it with no preparation other than the underlying fitness I already had. And I did okay. It took me one hour, 18 minutes, 10 seconds, and I was fifth in my age group, 45 to 49, and 48. And as somebody six foot six and 100 kilos, and often doing sports where this size doesn't really help, like running and cycling, it was pretty cool to do something where bits of the event really did suit me, which is part of the appeal of High Rocks. Most people will find something they're relatively good at, 
compared to other bits they may need to work on. So I decided that in the 12 weeks between Manchester and London High Rocks, I would get myself a proper coach, train really hard, drop from a sluggish 100 kilos down to a racing fast 94, and see what difference putting a lot of time and effort into my preparation made to the outcome. If you're wondering how I plan to get from 194 kilos, simple, eat no donuts. If you're now thinking, did I get to exactly 94? No, I raced yesterday at 100 kilos, cause donuts. Which brings us to the race, and big difference this time to Manchester was I had a target that I set just a few days after the January event in this video. Goal A, win my age group. Goal B, podium my age group. Goal C, sub 70 minutes. And although it's the third goal, because it's the third most impressive, it's the one I'm taking to heart, because I'm very much in control of that. In fact, I even, I even wrote it on my shoe. To get from Manchester's time, down to 70 minutes would require knocking eight minutes, 10 seconds off. And given that my Manchester time wasn't that bad in the first place, that's a lot to drop it by. We'll see. I'll track on screen the difference between London and Manchester as we go. Right, heading into the starting pen. And you race with about 30 runners in your wave, but they are random ages. So you have no idea if the people around you are in your age group, which, especially if you're in one of the older age groups, means it's important to not worry too much about what others are doing. Because the guys I'm really competing against in my age group, they might already be out on the course, or they might be running two or three hours later in the day. I'm going here at 11 a.m., the second wave of the open men's heats. The last one wasn't going till three in the afternoon. So you run your own race, sort of. For example, this guy here is Jake, who I've trained with in the past. He's younger than me, but I know he is gonna run a first lap sub four minutes, which is exactly what I wanna do. So I'm gonna sit with him for run number one. And we are off. 760 men in the open heats and 64 in my age group. That's more than double the 30 that I was racing in Manchester. And the first thing I got to correct from that last race was going out far too hot on lap one. I ran a three minute 40 first kilometer last time, quickest in my age group, but my plan for London was to back off fractionally on things I was already quite good at in order that I could improve dramatically on things I was bad at. So dropping 10 or 20 seconds on a fast run to save significantly more elsewhere seemed like a good plan. This time I come in from that run right on Jake's shoulder as planned in three minutes 56. And that still gave me the second fastest run in my age group, 66th overall. And I felt good coming into the ski erg, but 16 seconds down against Manchester. And because everything is tracked in high rocks using your ankle chip, I also know my transition time. That is how long did it take to get from the run track to the zone your current station is in. They call that time spent in the rock zone, not running and not doing a challenge. The rock zone is also where the water table is. Very easy to lose an awful lot of time there. Anyway, it took me 18 seconds longer this time in transition. So 34 seconds down overall. Well, I wasn't too bothered about that. How the zones are laid out within the arena will differ from event to event. So those transition times will never be the exact same, but the overall ground covered is always identical. So it may take longer to get from the track to a zone, but then elsewhere it will be quicker to get from the zone back out onto the track. All I really care about regarding transition times is not dawdling in them. So the ski erg is the one piece of kit I had not practiced on over the last 12 weeks. I just don't have access to one. Not a huge problem though. I did all right on it last time, four minutes 10. So this is a bit like that first run. It's another example of not worrying too much about the time because I know I'm gonna do okay anyway. It's more important to focus on getting off it feeling good still. Actually, it felt to me like it was taking longer than in Manchester, but I got a four minute dead, first in my age group and chips 10 seconds off my comparison time to Manchester. Took me just 11 seconds to get back out onto the track this time versus 24 seconds last time. It's another 13 seconds in the bank. Second run last time was a four minute 15 that I was quite happy with. So my four minute 13 this time was spot on. Although two seconds longer to transition into the sled push zone this time. So I start the push still 11 seconds behind overall. Mentally, the sled is good for me because you reach these early stations and they're clear of the previous waves that have all moved on. In the later events, you start catching people up from earlier waves. But here, you know the only people already here are from your wave. So I go in, there's only about six guys ahead of me. So I go into that feeling good. Now, last time on the sled push, I was pretty rapid, one minute 48, but I then left the push almost unable to walk. So I plan to go deliberately slower this time. I've been training on a sled for weeks. So this felt pretty comfortable and almost a chance to get my breath back. Keep calm, sip some water, more on water in a bit, and listen to Jen's great advice. No, Kate, come on! 
I end up leaving the sled push in 2 minutes 13, still fastest in my age group, 14th overall, despite being 25 seconds down on Manchester. And even though that puts me 36 seconds behind overall, I don't care because I felt better and that was going to be important later on. A few seconds longer to get back to the track this time, but a seven second faster run than last time before coming into the sled pull. Although I had a 17 second longer transition this time into the zone. That's just a layout of the arena issue, no big deal. Now the sled pull itself is an interesting one because as a bigger athlete, I always feel that it should be moving more easily than I seem to move it. I can just never get into a rhythm with this thing. I tried to save my legs initially by just sort of muscling it with my upper body. Then I tried a bit of walking backwards, pulling it, then some pulling across the body. To be honest, whatever I do, it just never feels very fluid. The only good thing about this station is that the photographs always look great. I ended up with a three minute 50, fifth in age group, and actually five seconds down on last time. However, after a three second quicker transition back onto the track, this time my pacing strategy was starting to kick in. I ran a four minute 41 as opposed to a four minute 58, 17 seconds faster than last time. And after a one second quicker transition into the burpees, it meant I was gonna start those 34 seconds down, but feeling good. Jen didn't know this, as so she was waiting for me to get there, she thought I was just being a bit useless. But we're going to be behind Manchester Times. He's got to get his ass into gear. What Jen also didn't know is that the camera goes into standby 30 minutes after the recording starts, and she wasn't stopping and starting recording between each event. She just left it on and wandered around the arena like a giant human dash cam. So it shut down at this point without her noticing. Now don't panic, she does spot this, but unfortunately it is after I completed the burpee broad jumps, which is a pity because this is the point in the event where everything started to turn around for me. So while we look at some random people doing burpees that I shot afterwards, I knew as I arrived at this station I was about 30 seconds down because I'd written on my arm a few key times from Manchester, including the time I came into the burpee zone. But I'm feeling all right, so I attacked these things. In Manchester, they were horrific. It took me over six minutes. My two big problems there were poor pacing up to that point when I went into it tired, and my technique for doing them was just wasteful. You can see me here standing fully upright and then pausing before jumping. What I've been practicing in the gym was what's been demonstrated here by Jade Skillin, High Rock's master coach. Getting up off the floor with a step up, and as you stand up, use that upward movement as the explosive jump forward, basically cutting out a chunk of what I've been doing before. And that combined with feeling better meant I was able to do far better, relatively. I'm still one of the biggest and heaviest people out there, so I'm never gonna be fast at something like this. But you can always be faster than you were, and I was. Three minutes 31, seventh in my age group, and it means I come out of the burpees two minutes 12 ahead of Manchester, and I then transition onto the track 32 seconds faster than Manchester. I'll talk about why I'm so quick on those transitions in a minute, but for now, two minutes 44 seconds up, game on. Camera is also back on, well done Jenna. Now if the burpee broad jumps were where I got to test my improved technique, my strategy, my fitness, the row is where I got to test my ego. Now, the run before the row was six seconds faster than Manchester, but because of the layout, it was a long distance in transition to the rowing zone, meant 12 seconds slower to get there. But I know as I come in here, I'm running about two and a half minutes ahead, and my apologies to this lovely marshal who wanted me sat up with everybody else, and I just wanted to be right in front of my own camera. So in Manchester, I rowed a three minute 57, fastest in my age group, second fastest across all open age groups there. In fact, I'm the only person anywhere in the world in my age group to row under four minutes, and only a few seconds off the fastest row of any open age group. So I'm an okay rower, and it crossed my mind to really push it this time around. In training, I've been rowing three minute tens quite comfortably. Don't forget the high rocks time starts as you enter the rowing zone and stops when you leave it, but allowing two lots of 15 seconds for that at either end I could probably do a 340 high rocks row time. That easily makes me the fastest open high rocks rower anywhere. And even among the pro times, there's only a couple of guys quicker. Hunter McIntyre is annoyingly fast. But I would be toast getting off the thing. My subsequent run would be appalling. I mean, it wouldn't be appalling because I'd be doing it knowing that I was now one of the fastest high rocks rowers in the world. It'd be quite exciting, but it's slightly stupid. It's kind of like sprinting 100 meters in the middle of a marathon and then getting all excited that you just had the fastest 100 meter sprint in the middle of a marathon. That wouldn't be very clever either. I mean, that sounds quite appealing too, but that's not the point. So I set aside my moronic rowing objective and instead decided to actually take it quite easy on the rower. 
I've been on aim for around four minutes. I knew that would still be quicker than most people there, and it would let me then carry some residual remaining energy into the rest of the event. So instead, I just settle in and pull a steady 145 minute split pace. It's all quite relaxing for me. I even have a chat with Jen at one point to work out where the exit point is in that zone that I have to get to afterwards. So while I'm finishing that row off, let's talk about why the transition times are getting better. Water. It gets real hot in there, and in Manchester I spent way too long at the water table glugging down fluids, and it occurred to me after that, I didn't actually need to consume the amount of water that I did. A bit like a boxer between rounds, I just wanted to almost have the taste of some water. So I ran with a water pack this time. I think I saw about two other people using them all day. It is not the norm. And as I stood at the start point, the only person using one in that wave, I almost ditched it, but I trusted my gut. And before the end of the first lap, I knew it was the right choice. As soon as you start running there, almost immediately in that hot environment, you get a dry mouth. I was able to sip the tiniest bit of water from my pack, had some electrolytes in it as well, and I felt good. I didn't go to the water table once in London. I didn't need to. As I'm rowing away here, I feel fine. I can remember last time my mouth was dry on the rower, I was gasping for fluids. So, lugging this little thing around, result. And I'm out of the row in a 3.59, still faster than anyone in my age group has ever rowed. A couple of seconds down on last time, but I'm feeling so much better. And so consequently, 22 seconds quicker getting back out onto the track than last time. No stopping for water. And even though I had to use some of that next run as a bit of recovery, it was still 10 seconds faster than the Manchester run at the same point. Now I only lost a second against last time transitioning into the farmer's carry, but while that's fine, the zone itself was the one part of the whole event where even as I was doing it, I knew I wasn't doing all I could. Manchester, I ran with those kettlebells, but here I am shuffling along like an old man, an even older man than I am. What I should have been doing is what this guy is doing here. The problem is when you move at speed with those kettlebells, every bounce of the weight has your traps screaming in pain. So to avoid that, I wasn't going fast. And I should have been. I don't need my traps for anything else this week. Jen could have brought the shopping in. I'd have been fine. On the plus side, when he came past me, it made me realize I was acting like a baby, at which point I started doing the event properly and ran right with him. But still, finished four seconds down on Manchester and not the fastest in my age group either. And I absolutely should have been completely serves me right. Moral of that story, if you're something of a big, strong, one-trick pony, at least do your one trick properly. Good news is those transition times, again, massively up on Manchester. 28 seconds faster getting back onto the track, 12 seconds faster on the run, add on four seconds faster getting into the sandbag lunges. That puts me three minutes, 49 seconds up overall. That is all good. The sandbag lunges themselves are not good at all. Unlike the burpees, where I sort of cracked the technique for doing them, despite doing plenty of lunges in training, they are just tough for me to do. People say long legs means a bigger stride, more inches covered, but that isn't really how the maths on it works. I have a long way up and down to go and a reasonable amount of body weight to be moving at the same time. Having a couple of extra inches doesn't really help. Not, not in this context. Shout out to this dude who catches me towards the end of the lunges and we start working in time with each other. There is no question he got me a few extra seconds on the end there. And this is a bit of high rocks that I love. At this stage, you have no idea what wave the people around you are in. So you aren't really racing them as such. But, and I've spoken about this on everything from park run videos through to ultra marathons and stuff. One of the best ways to go a tiny bit quicker at anything is to follow someone a tiny bit quicker than you. And the great thing here is that there is always somebody coming past you that you can latch onto, whether it was the kettlebell guy, uh, the lunge guy here, or one of the numerous people that was jogging past me on the laps, often just recognizing me off of here and shouting some encouragement. It all helps me go quicker. So ended up with a four minute 37, eight seconds up on Manchester, but still only 16th in my age group. It's annoying, but I don't quite know what to do about going faster on that one. It's probably got something to do with donuts. The good news was I followed it with a 29 second faster transition back out onto the track and that final run was eight seconds faster. But man, it was hard. I know that I'm running just over four minutes up at this point, because again, it was written on my arm. And so I'm struggling slightly mentally. My Manchester wall balls time was over six minutes. I know I can beat that. But I also know that to get sub one hour 10, I got to knock over eight minutes off. And even if I was five minutes up at this run point, I can't halve my wall ball time to make up that gap. So one hour 10 is a bust, but a PB is now guaranteed. I'm in a sort of target no man's land. Sub one hour 15 springs to mind as a round number to aim for, but that almost seems too easy. 
I was really running along, lacking motivation to go faster. I'm thinking a 113 or a 114, what difference does it make? And it showed. I should have run easily sub five minutes for that last kilometre. I ended up doing a 521, just eight seconds up on Manchester. It means I go into the warbles at one hour, seven minutes, 33 seconds, exhausted and lacking any tangible target. Had I known where others in my age group were going to end up, as we'll see later, I would have performed rather differently. As it was, I just sort of plodded through these things. It's actually quite strange to watch as a spectator because it's the last event. You think, why aren't people just getting these done? Just dig deep and rattle through them. I thought that watching people myself later on, even though I'd done it. But when you're in the middle of doing them, without a real clear goal, it is hard. If I'd come into this station side by side with somebody that I knew was in my age group and a strong contender, I would easily have found something more to give. In fact, that actually applies throughout the whole event. If you ran it in waves based on age groups, so you're literally racing other people, if you're remotely competitive, you would go faster. As it was, ended up getting them done in the end, five minutes, seven seconds. So 56 seconds up on last time, 10th in my age group. And so I go across the line, one hour, 12 minutes, 40 seconds, five minutes, 30 seconds up on Manchester which was a kind of interesting time in my head. Five and a half minutes is a chunk of time to knock off. An hour 12, pretty respectable, but it's not an hour 10. I suppose I felt content with that result. And in a way, being a good couple of minutes off my target was nice. If I'd been 10 or 20 seconds off, that would have been annoying. But then if I'd been that close, I'd have pushed harder on the war balls and probably got it done. Who knows? Looking back on the day, there was almost nothing I could have done to save two minutes 40. So pretty content. Until this happened, and I upgraded to very content. Okay, exciting update. We're just uh, sat having our lunch, and I had a look online at the results, and incredibly, I'm currently at 2 p.m. with, I think, an hour to go of racing in second place um, on the podium. Uh, Jen is highly impressed. Are you, how impressed are you? Jen is extremely impressed. Uh, I now have a very tense hour or so to see if somebody overtakes me. But it's very, very exciting news. Um, also, in less exciting news, one of my kids just sent me a text, the first half of which popped up on my watch that said that High Rocks event here today had just broken some records and been on the news, which was also very exciting. I then scrolled down. Uh, the, uh, the record was the most number of virgins running at one time so my kid now needs to find somewhere else to live so i hope that was worth it we're kicking them out aren't we oh yes that kid is gone so ignoring the fact that one of my children is a moron and now lives homeless under a bridge second place in age group it was a very stressful hour and a half looking at the results online to see if anybody would come in ahead of me before the end of the open heats. But ultimately, I got my tea towel. Mark Lewis! <laughs> yes, Mark, look at that. Look at that stature of a man. <laughs> yes, what well up, Mark? And because the podium ceremony took place much later in the day, first and third had already gone home, so never turned down an empty top spot on the podium. Round of applause for Mark! Yeah! <laughs> So before I wrap up with some quite exciting news, how do I feel it all went? Pretty good. The water pack was brilliant, only carried 500 mil, didn't even need to drink it all, couldn't tell I was wearing it, had it when I wanted it, never thirsty, never had a dry mouth, would never compete without one again. And it was interesting to hear that the marshals had all been told to not allow spectators to pass water to competitors, which is something that I think is a really good rule. I hope they make that very clear in future events. I don't think person A, who's there with a mate on hand with a bottle of LucasAid, should get that advantage over person B, who's got no friends. Everybody is allowed to carry water. Everybody's allowed to have access to the water table. That should be it. Right, what else? Uh, my watch, I used the lap function on here. The only two things I had showing on the Garmin, overall time and current lap time. As I'd go out onto the run, I'd start the lap. Primarily, so I could watch it as I was coming round to go in and make sure it showed about four minutes something. If it showed two minutes, I know I haven't done enough laps. You'd be surprised how many people run the wrong number of laps. But where it also helped in a way that I hadn't really thought of was that as I came around for the first lap, 
where it showed 220 or 230, it was a nice reminder to me, okay, you've done an easy one, let's now dig down on this second one. So the watch was good, my overall pacing was good, the strategy of backing off a fraction on things where fractions were tiny anyway, to win back some bigger chunks elsewhere, that worked. Uh, my time spent in the rock zone, not running, not doing a challenge, that was significantly reduced. Ultimately, sub one hour 10 would have been nice, but it was always gonna be an optimistic goal, especially at 100 kilos. The extra weight does make a big difference, especially on the running. If you don't think it does, grab yourself a five kilo weight, stick it in a backpack and go for an hour's jog. If I'd come in at target weight, every lap would have been quicker. But the podium was awesome to get. I uh, only missed first by 20 seconds or so. In fact, a few people have actually said to me, is that not frustrating to have been so close? but I genuinely did not deserve those 20 seconds. I am happy with second place. Looking back, I couldn't have got under one hour 10 on Saturday, but walking on those farmer's carries, uh, a few of the runs where people would come past me and encourage me, and I'd then find myself running along with them, but thinking, why wasn't I running this fast in the first place? Uh, not just banging out those wall walls. I could have gone quicker. I feel I gave almost as much as I could, but not completely as much as I could. Hence, happy with second. It's what I deserve. It's a nice reminder to dig deep next time. First place was achievable. I just didn't achieve it. Interestingly, I think sub one hour 10 was achievable if we ran in age group waves. In fact, I bet if you took the guy that beat me and the guy that I beat and the three of us ran together, knowing where each of us was, I reckon we'd all get pretty close to sub 70. But... That is not how the competition is run. And in many ways, especially for people just looking to enjoy the event, it is better for it. So what is next? I said after Manchester that I would not be racing again as a single runner in High Rocks after London. Instead, I signed Jenna and I up for the mixed doubles in October, Birmingham, and then November back in London. Plan was to muck about, do it for fun. However, a few things have changed slightly. Before anybody asks, no, I'm not going to Vegas for the World Championships in two weeks time, even though that second place did qualify me for it. It's tempting, but flying to another country for an event like that that requires qualification, that doesn't feel particularly in keeping with what I'm trying to do here. And I did say from the outset that London would be my last solo race. I mean, it's tempting, but I'm sticking to that, sort of. Here's what is happening. Something I get told quite a bit on the channel is that I'm constantly portraying myself as slightly above average and encouraging those a bit below average to come join me. And I'm told that is wrong because I am significantly above average. And I find that quite frustrating because I don't want people to think that I am at some sort of unachievable level. I'm not. All I've really done is plug away at my fitness from a starting position of terrible and just got slowly better. I did it, you can do it. You might have already done it. As a result, I go out of my way to compete in things that I am very unsuited for. Cycling, trail running. I've got another 100 kilometer ultramarathon coming up this year. Things that show me encountering hurdles and how to deal with them as somebody not naturally designed for that challenge. But it has always made me think how good it would have been to have been doing YouTube earlier in my fitness journey, when I was very clearly going through that transition from below to above average in everything that I did. But I can't turn back the clock. If only there was somebody I knew that could go on their own journey in a similar way and let me film them. Somebody that struggles to get under 30 minutes on a park run. Somebody who wanders into the gym a couple of times a week if they remember and doesn't really know what they're doing there. And somebody who eats too many donuts. So when Jenna and I run mixed doubles in the autumn, we aren't mucking about anymore. There will be a video on this to come, but sneak preview, Jen, who really does think that park run is a good way to ruin a trip to the park, uses the gym a couple of times a week at best, and has never met a donut that she didn't like, is gonna be working with Jade Skillen. Remember her? High Rocks Master Coach for the next 12 months. What will the results of that look like? I have no idea. If we entered mixed doubles today, we'd aim to not be last. By our own admission right now, Jen would probably physically struggle to run a single lap as fast as my slowest. We haven't really got a fixed goal yet, it's too early, but off the top of my head, my hope is that in October and November, we finish in the top half of all mixed doubles, above average. And in January next year, Jen will enter her first solo High Rocks event in the Women's Open and aim for above average in her age group. And because that means we're gonna be there anyway, I'll be back doing the solo male, but in the pro division. There is no rule about this, just what I think is right. Having got a podium in open, I just feel it's appropriate to not run open again and leave podium spots for those that are coming through. That's the plan. In theory, it will mean that along with all the other stuff that I do as normal on the channel, there'll be a lot of gen training really hard, getting pushed by Jade and transforming into 
Gen 2.0, a sort of fast tracking of a below to above average transition for your viewing pleasure. Or she'll hate it, divorce me, and I'll be living under a bridge with my moron child. It's exciting stuff. Okay, I am done. A massive thank you to everybody that Jen and I met at High Rocks. If you're one of the many people that came and said hi, thank you for doing so. It is brilliant to hear just so many people talking so positively about what we're trying to do here with encouraging people into being fit and healthy and having a laugh. And if you're one of the people yelling out as I went around on the track, again, huge thanks. Genuinely made me move quicker. Okay, I'm off to bed to rest. Uh, got any questions, drop them in the comments, give the video a like and subscribe. Head over to my Patreon page if you want some extra bits and pieces and I will see you on the next one. Oh, and no, it wasn't a Terminator 2 level sequel performance, was it? But I don't think it was Predator 2 bad either. Unfortunately, Arnold doesn't really have any other sequels that I can use. Um, Conan the Destroyer, but I've already lost the under 30s with all the Predator 2 references. I don't even know who Danny Glover is. I don't know another sequel that's pretty good, but not as great as it should have been. Bad Boys 2, that would do. Can we talk about Will Smith again, positively? I don't know, I can't keep up. I'm really too tired. Come on, come on! Come on!